Good afternoon and welcome to ITS Canada's 2020 Supplier Webinar Series. Today is the seventh of our weekly series. Welcome to all. My name is Janneke and I'm the Managing Director of ITS Canada. Today, we are being joined by four members. Smart Traffic Solutions, Key to Access, Multilink and Tacel, who each will share their new initiatives, products or services to aid the industry in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Each company will be given 10 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A. For those who have any questions, please use the questions pane. And after each presentation, I will share your question or questions with the respective presenter. Thank you. Our first presenter, Amir Gotts, is the CEO of Smarts Traffic Solutions. He has more than 10 years of experience bringing ITS hardware and software solutions to the market. Amir founded Smarts Traffic Solutions in 2016. The company is specialized in designing and manufacturing of real-time road congestion monitoring sensors and data analytics and has delivered its solution to more than 10 countries globally. Amir holds a PhD degree in traffic engineering from the University of Waterloo and has a long track record of academic research and industrial contributions to the areas of intelligent transportation system. And I am going to make Amir the presenter. Amir, over to you. Okay, can you hear me and can you see the presentation? Yes, I can. Maybe you want to put it in slide mode. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jenica and ITS Canada for the opportunity and thanks everyone who has joined this webinar today. So today I want to give you uh, an overview of our traffic monitoring solution and how our customers have used it in different applications. Uh, we also see how we have learned uh, from the customer's data to build better data analytics. And we're also going to see some traffic data related to COVID-19 pandemic and opportunity to use the data to improve uh, traffic mobility. For those who are not familiar with the SMATs, uh, we, are a supplier, we are a supplier for sensors and software analytics for traffic congestion monitoring. Our sensors are Bluetooth and Wi-Fi detectors with a leading detection rate in the market, and uh, they have come in different form factors for pole mount, traffic cabinet, and portable deployment. Our data analytics uh, that you see on the right side called iNode is a cloud-based application for analysis and visualization of travel time, delay, and origin destination data. iNode can also generate traffic alerts so you can monitor the status of the traffic from comfort of your home, computer, or mobile phone. In addition to the sensors data, iNode can ingest data from third-party cloud source data providers on, on the same pl platform. So our clients have the option to use either the uh, that, either data sources or have a mix of both. So when it comes to the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi MAC address detection technology for travel time, the concept is uh, simple. So we get a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi enabled device detected at two different locations and at two different time, uh, time stamps. So we can calculate travel time and average the speed of the segment. Uh, so there are two challenges here that we want to address. So while this is a cost effective technology for real time congestion monitoring, we want to capture a good sample from the passing vehicles to generate a statistically reliable data and we also want to separate our main traffic stream data from other possible car movements that might be slower or faster than the main traffic, and we call them outliers. So we are going to talk uh, more about sample size uh, and also outlier filtering today in this presentation. So why does sample size matter? So the reason is that the, the minimum required sample size, as you see on the graph, uh, and this graph depends on the level of variation in travel time. So we might be okay with 5% sample size for a high volume highway installation with low variability in travel time. However, for arterial installation, we might experience higher variation due to signal or still parking. And for that, we might need 40% detection to capture those variation 
in order to get a statistically reliable data. So that's the main reason that we want to have sensors uh, with the uh, uh, good detection rate for different applications. We have engineered our sensors to detect uh, four different Bluetooth and Viper signals, and depending on the speed of traffic and where we deploy them, the sensors uh, uh, can run two signals at the same time, and with that, we guarantee the de detection of 30 to 40 percent of the ground truth traffic volume, which is a pretty good sample size for this technology. So the iNode application has been designed for a real-time traffic monitoring uh, and running various historical analysis. We have developed a state-of-the-art filtering algorithm which allows us to successfully deploy our sensors in uh, very challenging projects. Uh, the iNode has the capability to re remotely monitor and configure the sensors and receive email or text notifications when traffic status changes, which is particularly important during the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know. So the performance of the filtering algorithm, as I mentioned, is, an, is, is important to receive reliable travel time data. Uh, whether you are posting the data on a message sign or for an internal use, you want to make sure that what's being generated from these systems are uh, generating a true real-time uh, travel time data. So here's an example that we have uh, from Highway 401 when congestion is happening. Uh, this is during a PM peak hour. So the, the top graph shows the data with the outliers and the, the bottom one when the filtering algorithm has been applied to the data. So it's important to make sure we can capture all the up, up and down trends and sharp edges on the data that typically naive algorithm, uh, algorithm fail to capture. Uh, to capture those. So you may end up you know, showing a travel from a message sign that are not really uh, what the the real real system or real travel time is uh, and what the travelers are experiencing now. So we have another another uh, example here for uh, performance of the filtering algorithm in this slide. So this data is coming from an arterial installation in Minneapolis, where the data points are more clustered because of the traffic signal, and we have a data gap somewhere here in the middle. Uh, that might be uh, due to a lane closure or an emergency vehicle passing. Again, it's important here that after data filtering, we can capture all the variations and also be uh, and the new trend that uh, we are seeing a gap here uh, when the status of traffic is changing and we make sure that those gaps are actually bridged correctly by the algorithm. So the, the last example uh, is even more challenging because we have outliers on both uh, high and low sides of the traffic stream. So this data is from a port a gate wait, uh, a, from a port gateway from in Los Angeles, where there is a fast-moving car traffic for this for the staff vehicle and trucks who might uh, also stop in the middle waiting for their appointment. So we have the outliers on the top and the bottom. So as you can see, after filtering, we could separate those data points from the truck traffic getting into, into the port. Uh, separated from the slow moving and fast moving vehicles. So the alert on the iNode is a feature that has been developed for uh, remote monitoring, and especially with all the distractions that we experience uh, when we work from home, this comes handy. This is something that you can set on travel time or speed, uh, and based on some static or historical value that you can set, you, may, uh, you can get an email notification. So, for example, here we have set an alert on the speed when the, the speed drops 20% uh, below the historical average, we get email notification. So, this is an, an alert history graph that you see on the left side, available on the web application uh, for the iNode, and also uh, this is an attachment to the email that you receive where you can see all the status changes when an alert goes off and when it returns back to normal. So even without opening the application, you can uh, look at the email and see this graph and when the alert gets triggered and uh, when how long it stays in that trigger mode and when it comes back to normal uh, from the comfort of your, uh, your mobile phone. Okay, so we have uh, deployed our technology in different use cases and environments. Uh, so we have an installation on Highway 401 uh, a city of Ottawa, uh, 
who is using our crowdsource option for different applications. And we have two core deployments uh, in Los Angeles for gateway time for the trucks and also a port of to RVA in Quebec, uh, supported by Transport Canada and Public Works for detailed monitoring uh, of truck, uh, uh, truck activities outside as well as inside the port. Let's look at some data from the COVID-19 impact on traffic. Uh, looking at the three road segments on Highway 4, uh, 401 for before and after COVID-19, so on the left, we have data here for March 9th and 10th for the before period uh, and March 16th and 17th for the after period when Ontario uh, work from home order, uh, order was out. So for the before period pandemic, so as you can see here, we were uh, typically seeing AM congestion, especially for the first segment. Um, while the after pandemic, which you can see on the right side, uh, so the speed of traffic was almost at free flow speed throughout the day. And the, comp and the graph here is comparing the, uh, basically these four days. So the two days uh, before pandemic, we had typically an, an uh, AM congestion uh, for, during the, the, the AM peak and for the after period on March 16th and 17th, basically the speeds were almost at the, at the free flow speed. So here is the opportunity to use the data in the, in the new conditions uh, imposed by COVID-19. So uh, we might be able to conduct range reallocation projects to use the new data or to use the new data for uh, to timing the sig traffic signals that were set based on the pre-pandemic data. So we might also be able to add uh, new bike lanes, detour or bus routes or on the street parking that were not possible uh, during the, uh, the before COVID-19 pandemic because of the uh, large volume in traffic. So the key, the key here is that, that to have the measurement tools in place and constantly monitor the, uh, the impact of these changes to use the road, road, road capacity more efficiently. Uh, and also we want to allocate the capacity fairly between the different users based on the data, uh, data we get from, from these systems like ours. So, that, uh, so that's why we call it the data-driven decision-making is, is an important key here. So that was the presentation uh, for today. So any questions? Thank you, uh, Amir. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, on the data that you gather, for example, on the 401, can that be separated by um, the modes of vehicles that are on the road. So let's say a commercial vehicle uh, versus a personal vehicle. Uh, typically, no, we cannot um, uh, separate the, the traffic uh, streams based on different modes. Uh, so we have an option sometimes that uh, we call the Bluetooth tagging. So for Bluetooth tagging, that if you are able to, to tag those fleet of vehicles with a specific MAC address, so we are able to separate those from the other stream. So what those needs to be tagged uh, somehow with our, with our Bluetooth tags that, that, uh, that we have used for some of the clients. Okay, thank you. The other question is with respect to um, the two pictures that you showed on the port, so Port of LA and the port in Trois-Rivières. Um, you indicated that uh, the impact on traffic um, on personal vehicles before and after COVID sorry, before and during COVID showed um, like a decrease, yes, here. Um, have you also uh, gathered any in uh, different data uh, with respect to the ports? Has there been an increase in the movement of trucks, the movement of goods? Has there any, can you, has that been changed or has that increased? This is actually from the Highway 401. So these two heat maps that you see here, so these are from yep. Highway 401. For the port yep. deployment, we, we were seeing a similar pattern from the, uh, from the port, uh, uh, so we were in touch with them, and basically, you know, they were informing us of the status of their operation and what is the uh, Los Angeles when was the, the lockout time for them, and then they are more a little bit back to normal. So they also have they are seeing this data on their dashboard, and they are basically seeing that the impact of COVID-19 on their on their road traffic as well. And uh, when you say they see it on the dashboard, are we talking about the uh, truck drivers? 
no the uh, the, the the port operation actually so the port Auto drivers port yeah the port drivers can see the waitcom on the on the port website and yeah. on the on the, mo on the mobile app that they have but basically this is being a uh, uh, process by the port itself uh, reading the data from our api to uh, to show it to the public for right. the truck drivers good, good. thank you um the data that you gather, I guess that's anonymous data? That's correct. So the data for the, the MAC detection, we, uh, we apply a, a hashing algorithm to anonymize the data uh, to respect the privacy. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Those are all the questions that I had. Um, so thank you very much, Amir. Thank you. Next is Sophie. Sophie is an entrepreneur with a creative spirit. She is a co-founder and CEO of key to access a tech startup that provides smart city solutions to improve accessibility for the visually and mobility impaired. key to access flagship product tackles the many difficulties faced at crosswalks by removing the physical obstacle of having to press the pedestrian button. With the key to access app or FOB, the visually and mobility impaired can now request crossings from the palm of their hand. Sophie continuously contributes to elevating the social cost of accessibility through her public speaking skills, having won many pitch competitions, including, including the highly publicized Montreal Startup Fest Video Ton Pitch Contest. And with that, I'm going to make Sophie the presenter. Sophie. Thank you, Yannicka, for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen I'm presenting now? Yes. Great, great. Um, so thank you, thank you for setting this up, Yannicka, and I think um, I can speak for everyone that um, all of the previous webinars were greatly appreciated as well, and, and we've been learning a lot, so thank you. Um, my intent with the presentation here is to focus a little bit more on pedestrian travel and the infrastructure methodology uh, that we currently have in place and, and how that will potentially evolve uh, with the pandemic and the future or our new normal uh, post-pandemic. So during this time, I think what's on everyone's mind is very much uh, expressed by this quote here, the biggest conversation during the pandemic is the role of streets as a principal public space in cities. And so we've seen the, our projected view of uh, a smart city uh, kind of come to a halt. Um, most metropolitans have been gearing up to uh, increased urban living, um, you know, a push towards uh, public transportation, and so all of that has kind of come to a screeching halt as, as everybody has observed. And it poses the question of what does the new normal look like? And do our previous, um, uh, our previous aspirations of what our cities uh, were to grow into still accurate? And so that's what I wanna to discuss today is what was our vision and is that vision still applicable when it comes to pedestrian travel? So during this pandemic, we've identified two major trends when it comes to the response, the immediate response um, to ensure safety and, and uh, really answer uh, what the communities have been pushing for. And so the large one here is the deactivation of beg buttons across the country. And so that has been observed in many cities, Edmonton, Vancouver, Calgary, Ottawa, and many more. And I think what's interesting to see here is this push um, on many occasions has come from the population. So whether it's through counselors or citizens themselves, it seems that this is really a representation of the psychological evolution that we're going through here. And, uh, the psychological piece 
I think is going to be key in designing our infrastructure response for the future. And so the deactivation of beg buttons is a very uh, immediate and, and potentially short-term uh, response to the pandemic. And the question is, is this really the ideal long-term solution? So there are many different reasons as to why uh, this may not be the case. Evidently, the beg buttons were placed uh, initially for, for, um, for a reason and actuated um, and actuated intersections in certain areas are uh, what was deemed ideal for traffic flow. And so with this migration to fixed time cycles, what will this look like when everybody gets back on the road? Um, right now, everything's on pause, so we're not seeing the impact. But when everybody gets back on the road, what will that look like? And one of the interesting elements um, that I learned on a previous on a previous uh, webinar was, I believe Novax was mentioning a statistic coming from China that post their first wave, they've seen a major spike in the purchase of uh, personal vehicles. And so, what will that look like for traffic flow and? Uh, inter fixed time intersections is to be seen. The second element that we've noticed is road closures and the expansion of walkways. So making room for pedestrian activity um, as that uh, has been seen to, to be more and more prevalent uh, in our cities. People are stuck at home, we wanna go out more and more. Um, uh, and, and the best way to do that by respecting social distancing um, is cities have found that increasing the pedestrian uh, pedestrian available space is the solution for that. So again, what will that look like in the future and how will this uh, bode with uh, vehicles coming back on the road? So the question here is, do we still want to press the button? when you know uh, everything comes back to normal and hopefully a vaccine is found, how will this have impacted the psyche of the population? And is a button, um, is a button even uh, still the optimal solution here? And so it, it really begs the question of, there is an opportunity to rethink our infrastructure in response to the pandemic, but also ensuring that that solution uh, meets the needs of our future new normal and not only the immediate now uh, during this very difficult time. And so um, from what we've seen and from, from what our clients have told us and, and the different community groups that we work with is people are very reluctant to touch the buttons either using their elbows um, or waiting, not knowing how the buttons work, waiting for a cycle to potentially change. So um, this is a very important question as we continue to plan for infrastructure of the future. And so as we were kind of posed the question by, by Yannicka and ITS is what are we all doing during this time to, to better service our clients and, and bring our solutions to uh, aid in, in, these, in these types of problems. And so key to access was originally designed as a, an alternative to the pedestrian button and I should say actually a complement to the pedestrian button as a wireless uh, alternative to request to cross via a smartphone or a fob. Um, the original design was focused on accessibility and the reason for that and we're, I'm going to go into it in a few minutes um, was to eliminate the physical barriers that uh, will always exist with a button on the pole. But now what we're finding is this solution is taking on a new meaning during this very difficult time. And so having the ability to request to cross at an intersection from your personal device would not only reduce contamination, but also give the visually and mobility impaired community a tool that really works for them. And so in, in doing so, we're really thinking our original design of this technology was focused to the visually and mobility impaired uh, problem at the intersection and, and, and what the challenges that they are facing at the intersection are. And now we're seeing that anybody can use this technology and it can serve a dual purpose. Um, so one of the things that we're focused on is not only solving one primary issue 
what we were originally designed to to deliver on but also thinking how can we um how can we grow with our clients as this new normal is um is uh unpredictable and not knowing what that will look like and so our uh, solution does also elevate the management of the pedestrian system by integrating a, a IOT network within the system. Um, so these are these are just three points that I wanted to mention. One, how all our different technologies can be rethought or or tweaked to help in this immediate. Uh, in this immediate crisis, but also continue to support cities um, as we all find the new normal. As I mentioned, our technology was originally designed around the needs of the visually mobility impaired, and the population size um, is quite a lot larger than most uh, typically think. So 22% of Canadians actually are living with some form of disability and are impacted by um, inaccessible spaces day to day. And so key to access really came to life around the desire to harness the power of technology to create more inclusive communities. So outside of assisting with the uh, uh, reducing contamination of, of communal surfaces like the push button, uh, what key to access really does is eliminates the physical challenges surrounding those buttons regardless of, of um, uh, the immediate issue with, with COVID-19. So a physical contact, one of the elements is physical contact with the button. So if you are in a wheelchair, any sort of assisted mobility device, physically making contact with the button can be extremely challenging and not to mention for the visually impaired, oftentimes the locator tone that is available isn't sufficient for them to effectively locate the, the, the button. And I think the, the key element here is everybody is different and um, the needs vary from person to person. And so it's very difficult to have a one size to fit all button on the pole that will suit everybody's needs. Hence why we wanted to focus on creating a complement to the existing infrastructure uh, to ensure that everyone is serviced. The second one is really the pole placement. Pole placements are obviously limited um, based on the intersections design. And so oftentimes um, they can be challenging and unable to be uh, uh, rectified in the immediate future simply because of cost. And so um, not only can pole placement be unideal, but they are always inconsistent and unpredictable from a visually impaired pedestrian's uh, point of view. The third element is the uncertainty around crossing cycles. And so um, what, what that really means here is from intersection to intersection, having different, uh, having different um, technology available, having a push button, having an APS, having no button at all creates an inconsistency in the environment. And so that, that really leads to an uncertainty around when it is time to cross for a visually impaired person. And finally, the lack of information about the environment. Um, many people don't realize how many visual cues we receive uh, at the intersection that allow us to cross safely or really understand um, what we're doing and at what time. So not only is there the visual cue of the walking man that is translated with an audible cue, um, but there are the street signs. Um, all of these different elements that come into play uh, when we cross the street. Another example would be the fact that there's a pedestrian island in the middle of the crossing or that there's a sign that the crossing is under construction. All of these different elements that um, a sighted person will quickly respond to and change their course of action, a visually impaired person does not have the opportunity to. Um, why I mention these existing challenges here within the, the context of COVID is when we're looking at key to access and developing our solution and continuing to service our clients, this was the, um, this was the climate that we were responding to. And now we're realizing that our solution can also um, service uh, in, in the service in the um, intent of reducing the spread of the pandemic. And so uh, this really speaks to the evolution of 
of our vision of our product, but also recognizing that cities can solve an immediate problem, but also um, uh, solve potential future issues or previous issues that were taking place. 30 seconds left. So how it works is they city simply install a receiver into the pedestrian signal head um, and the design is complementary to all of the existing infrastructure. So whether there's a push button, APS, no button, um, if it's actuated or fixed time, the system uh, will respond accordingly. Another interesting element here is it allows cities to customize uh, customize their uh, their um, their system, track uh, track pedestrian movement, and um, control the system easily from uh, their head office. So really, I'll finish here. Is it's an opportunity to rethink things. I believe uh, COVID-19 has put everyone on pause. And uh, the question that we want to pose to the, to the group is, how can we ensure that we are not only answering the immediate, uh, the immediate crisis, but taking the time to think of how these solutions can apply to our new normal um, and, and uh, continue to service our clients beyond this uh, immediate crisis? So, Yannicka, I'll pause here because I think I went a little bit uh, over. Um, so I'll pause yes. here for some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we want to make sure that we give all presenters equal opportunity. Um, obviously, it shows um, uh, an opportunity uh, to be flexible. Uh, and I think you alluded very much to that. Um, I think that when I cross the street, I don't even think I either press a button or I don't. Is It's so normal for me. Um, to take a look at the sign, but when you are, uh, when you can't see, um, and there's no audible sign, um, sometimes we can stay, we can wait forever at uh, intersection, even near where my house is. Um, have you ever thought, or maybe it exists already, that um, there's cameras installed in, um, uh, I guess, traffic light posts that uh, sensor when there, that sense when there's a person there that wants to cross the street, and then that will trigger a traffic light to um, go from uh, green to orange to red, and then people can cross the street that way. Is there technology out there like that? Is that something your software um, would be able to do? Uh, so I think the um, there definitely are technologies out there that will um, will capture if someone is standing at an intersection. The issue is um, really anticipating which direction they want to cross. And so in the North American climate, uh, because all crosswalks are typically at the intersection, the uncontrollable element is understanding which direction does that person want to cross? Are they wanting to cross north-south or are they wanting to cross east-west? And so with the technologies that um, can simply capture is someone standing there, there are two things that can potentially happen. One is that person is standing there to wait for the bus or to wait to be picked up or simply just standing there and not wanting to, not wanting to cross. And so it could potentially trigger um, useless, uh, useless pedestrian requests. And so uh, that could definitely impact traffic flow. And the second element is um, by not knowing which direction the individual wants to cross, the only option would be to, to request both intersections, uh, oh, sorry, request both crossings. And so in many cities, there are scattered intersections that in essence are, are doing that. What is the challenge in that uh, specific example for the visually impaired community is they really need the isolated sound for either the north-south crossing or the east-west crossing to align themselves in order to get to the other side safely. And so if you're requesting both directions, not only would that, you know, uh, incur useless calls that, you know, we really try to minimize those, um, it would not, in uh, at the end of the day, service the community that uh, we're trying to service. Thank you. And there's a question, uh, and if you can answer that sort of short, um, Danielle is wondering, what about the privacy of our movements? 
Very good question. And so the system is designed around traffic tracking profile types. It doesn't track any uh, personal information. What it tracks is if you are visually impaired, mobility impaired, cyclist, other. Uh, and so cities can see what are the hot spots for visually and mobility impaired uh, individuals and where to better spend their accessibility budgets. So it doesn't track any uh, personal information, simply those profile types, as well as the your um your resident city so uh clients can also see how many pedestrians are local and how many are tourists very very interesting thank you very much and those are the questions thank you you're welcome next step is nicholas williams nicholas is the regional sales manager for Multilink Inc, as well as a fiber optic infrastructure specialist. Nick has been in the ITS industry for several years now and travels throughout the US and Canada, promoting and training people on how their products work. These products include Multilink's power solutions, as well as their vast fiber portfolio, which includes fiber connectivity, fiber optic assembly, fiber optic closures, fiber optic cable, and much more. And I am going to make Nicholas the presenter. Nicholas, over to you. Hi, right, thank you, Yannicka. Can you guys see my screen currently? Mm, it's black. Okay, how about now? Yes. All right, it's in presenter view and everything? Sorry, I was muted, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so yeah, everyone, um, I'm Nick Williams. I work for Multilink. Uh, what Multilink does is they're a, they're a manufacturer. Uh, soft, they do software development, uh, product services, network powering for both cable TV, telecom, and DOT applications. Uh, we do sheet metal fabrication, powder coating, plastic extrusion, injection molding, fiber optic assembly. Uh, and so pretty much anything that encompasses uh, passive optical networks, DOT or ITS applications, uh, we are a manufacturer uh, and we have a, a central location here in Elyria, Ohio. And this presentation is going to be covering DOT and ITS specific applications. Uh, in Canada, you know it as ITS. Uh, in the States, it's DOT or Department of Transportation. So just a, a brief history of Multilink power product specific. Uh, Multilink introduced the first true UPS to the cable TV market uh, in 1999. What true UPS means is that it's a, a genuine uninterruptible power supply. And when I say uninterruptible, I mean there is no direct path uh, from the input power to the output power. Uh, it is what we call a double conversion, uh, meaning that power comes in is rectified uh, from AC power to DC power, cycled through a battery string, and then uh, rectified back to uh, AC. We also have patented several different ways to keep power equipment in the ITS field cool for longer without the use of electronics. Um, for instance, a, an air-cooled lifesaver roof uses uh, heat induction to cool your equipment in a cabinet um, and it's very valuable, especially in, in the summer months. Uh, we have patented inverter technology in all of our UPS systems. And everything that we design is designed, engineered, manufactured, and produced uh, in Elyria, Ohio. Multilink has a worldwide footprint, and that is a, an important annotation because uh, our products are deployed pretty heavily in, in South America. And so if our power products can last and function properly uh, in the harsh climates of South America, you know, dealing with humidity and heat wise, uh, they can most definitely uh, last and work properly in Canada and the United States. So to touch on Multilink's response to COVID-19, uh, we've been providing solutions to broadband, telecom, industrial, renewable utility, and data center applications for several decades. Uh, but as a manufacturer, um, you know, we have capabilities that a lot of other companies do not have. And so we started ramping up production of personal protective equipment. Uh, we make shoe covers 
And we also have been making the protective masks and layering for hospital workers. Uh, so we've really taken a role, especially in the United States, on, on using our manufacturing capabilities to, to aid uh, other industries, not just our own. Uh, we've maintained a full staff throughout this whole thing, and we have also not cut back production at all. We have allowed everyone in our company who can work from home or can uh, telecommute uh, to work from home and telecommute. So Multilink has helped the industry in this time by doing what we can to uh, provide our services and our products uh, without much of a hiccup. So <clears throat> the bread and butter of this this conversation or this present this presentation in my uh, role here is to explain to you that that we make two different types of UPS systems. We make both a, a line interactive UPS system as well as a double conversion system. A line interactive system is not a true UPS. All it does is provide filtered and regulated AC output of the proper voltage uh, to your load. And so whatever power equipment you have in, in your cabinet controlling the traffic controllers, uh, the cameras, the alarms, the motion sensors, data collection, anything as technology evolves, the more equipment, the more electronics we need to have at an intersection in order to maintain uh, a, you know, a functioning ITS infrastructure. And so what our power supplies do is they offer a solution uh, when there's stags or surges or brownouts or the absence of utility power, anything that happens um, that would cause the electronics uh, allowing the infrastructure of traffic to flow. When, whenever there is a uh, an outage, what our products do is they kick on and provide power. So a line interactive uh, UPS just filters power and then it has a four tap system. It utilizes what we call buck and boost technology. So there's a four tap of predetermined paths that the voltage would take. So you have an input, you have input power coming in. There's a microprocessor that interprets that voltage, selects one of the four taps. So if you have, let's say 90 volts coming in, and your nominal output uh, or desired output would be 120 volts. Uh, there's a predetermined path that that microprocessor selects, steps up the voltage, and then it you know, comes out 120 volts. In the absence of utility power, uh, it turns into or switches to inverter mode and rectifies DC power to AC power, uh, supplying power to the load. And so there is a direct path to whatever your load is, whatever the cameras, monitors, whatever you're supplying power to, um, it does not cut off that path. A double conversion power supply is what we call a true UPS, meaning you have power coming in, that power gets rectified, cycled through the batteries, and then inverted from the batteries back to AC power, meaning there is no direct path from the input voltage to the output voltage. The purpose of using a double conversion power supply is so that if you have sensitive equipment or uh, equipment that can't quite handle the fluctuation of power, uh, that it might damage the equipment or it is not designed uh, to handle fluctuation of power, that is when you would use a double conversion power supply. Uh, so in the event or the absence of utility power, there's actually no gap or no lapse in time that your equipment experiences any difference in the power that is being provided to it. So here's an example of a line interactive power supply. We have three different models, 650 watt, 1100 watt, and 1500 watt. It has all the dry contact relays for alarm reporting and conflict monitors. It is also embedded with a, a web page, so you can remotely control and monitor uh, this line interactive power supply, meaning there's no need to roll a truck in the field in order to interact with it. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, automatic voltage regulation using that buck and boost technology. Uh, so you have that microprocessor inside uh, of the line interactive UPS, interpreting the voltage, selecting which predetermined path that electricity needs to take in order to achieve the nominal or desired output of 120 volts AC. 
Here's a visual. So as the uh, as the input voltage fluctuates on the grid, which happens quite often, our power supplies uh, keep the voltage relatively the same on the output side. Here's a double conversion series. We also uh, have three output capacities of double conversion, 700 watt, 1050 watt, 1400 watt. Uh, same bells and whistles as the line interactive UPS. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at one of these, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can just visit our website. I don't wanna waste time going over specifics of it. So here is a, uh, a screenshot of the embedded web page of both of our power products. So you have all the information there, all the operating parameters that you've set, and you're able to interface with it pretty much any operating parameter you can set uh, and interface with without the need to roll a truck into the field. So safety automatic transfer switch, what this does is this toggles utility power, your load power, and also generator power. So this uh, provides automatic source power source selection. Uh, so if you have utility outage, uh, your, your UPS turn, switches to inverter mode, and once your battery string is empty, this will automatically switch to generator mode while rectifying power and charging those batteries. And then once those batteries are charged, it'll shut off the generator and pull power from the batteries. And so it, it's really just a brain that you could install into the cabinet. That way you don't have to select the power yourself or really even closely monitor where your equipment's getting its power from. But of course, if you want to monitor all of the equipment in your cabinet, you would use what is called a smart tracker. Uh, Multilink has created this uh, remote power management strip, essentially. It's embedded with an IP address. Uh, so on a website, you can log in and control each one of these independent 515 outlets. It has eight independent dry contact relays in the back for alarm reporting and the operation of peripheral equipment within the cabinet. It has a GPS tracking utilizing Google Maps. And so basically what the smart tracker is, uh, in short, if you put this product in a power cabinet, in an ITS cabinet or whatever you would want to call it, there's no need for you to roll a truck uh, to find an issue with your equipment in the field. You can select the power uh, the power grid for whatever piece of equipment. So if I have a UPS plugged into outlet number one and I need to cycle through that power, I can go onto the web, web page for the smart tracker, click outlet number one, and I can reset that outlet automatically. You can also set it up on a schedule uh, so that it, it, you know, it'll restart your equipment, cycle power through all of your equipment, let's say at, at 3 a.m. every night, you wanna reset your equipment. Uh, it'll do that automatically for you. It also has an event log and you could set it up for email uh, confirmation as well. That way you know um, that it's operating functionally, operating properly and all of your equipment in the cabinet uh, is operating properly as well. This is a really big money saver, uh, especially for people that are uh, in rural areas and very congested areas. It allows you to control all of your equipment from a remote location and status monitor. Another thing that Multilink makes and designs manufactured illuminated street signs. Um, this is something new that we're getting into, uh, but we do currently have uh, the thinnest illuminated street sign in the industry at this time. Uh, it's only two inches in depth, it comes fully customizable. We print these out, uh, the signs out uh, on our campus and we can pretty much make any design uh, that, that you can think of, uh, especially with all the manufacturing capabilities that we offer. And Janneke, uh, that completes my presentation for this afternoon. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and I had a couple of questions. It, some of it already has been answered. Um, if there are issues with the batteries in the cabinet, um, I gather at the, the last product that you showed, uh, it can be, um, if there's an issue, um, fixed maybe remotely. But in the cases where yeah. it's not, um, do you have technicians that go out uh, in the field? And are they technicians that are employed by Multilink 
or um, and and what has been currently put in place with respect to COVID-19 safety measures. Okay, so when you say issues with batteries in the field, um, so, so we, we batteries do not... in the cabinets in the truck okay, cabinets. Yeah. Yep. So if you have issues with with batteries, uh, the use of a safety automatic transfer switch in one of our cabinets would help you. Uh, we okay. Let me back up. We do not have technicians in the field. We do offer uh, support for the life of the product. Uh, so that being said, if you have issues with any of our equipment in the field, you can call us, and we we do often send people out from our office. Because uh, we have several experts that work with us on all of this technology, uh, but we do not have technicians. Uh, typically, if you do have issues with batteries in a cabinet, uh, you do have to disconnect your UPS in order to maintain those batteries. But with the use of a safety automatic transfer switch, we have a manual bypass switch on there. Uh, so with that automatic power source selection, we also have manual power source selection. So you can bypass uh, the power, meaning divert the power away from uh, the UPS while still providing power to your load, switch out that battery, and then manually flip the switch back and it will operate as usual. Um, in terms of knowing that you have an issue with the battery, the smart tracker and all of our UPSs on the embedded web page uh, provide status monitoring capabilities for the battery. So you can actually see what voltage the batteries are at uh, and, and the life of the expected life of the battery. You can also, uh, we manufacture battery balancers that we highly recommend if you're gonna go with a multi-link battery backup solution. Uh, we offer battery balancers and what a battery balancer does is it just cycles through power or trickle charges your batteries in the field. Uh, and this, what this does is this, this keeps your batteries from basically for lack of better words, going stale. Uh, it, it keeps the batteries moving, uh, keeps energy flowing through them, keeping them healthy, and it, it usually prolongs the life of your battery one to two years. Good. Thank you. And those were the questions that I had. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Last but not least, Jeff Smart is the Vice President of TESEL. Jeffrey started with the company in 1984 as an inside salesperson and has gradually worked his way to becoming president from 2013 until 2019. Jeff has 34 years of experience in the traffic control industry. He holds a diploma in electrical engineering technology from Ryerson Polytechnic Institute. Jeff is also a member of the IMSA Ontario section and he was Ontario chapter president from 1993 to 1994. He sits on the board of ITS Canada since 2007 and is co-chair of the Exhibitor Advisory Committee for ITS Canada 2021. And Jeff, I will make you the presenter. Thank you. And thank you, Yannicka. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. So thank you very much, Yannicka, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank um, ITS Canada for this opportunity and for everyone attending today. Uh, today my speech is, or my topic today is about how COVID-19 has affected the operation of traffic control signals and including the operation of pedestrian push buttons. So we're going to be talking about different types of technologies that are out there now and what uh, may be available in the future, what's on the horizon. So one thing is, is that we're going to talk about touchless buttons, um, apps, accessible push buttons. And is there anything that we can do differently? And the one thing that we need to all take into consideration when we're, we're doing this is that we all have to understand and abide by that the accessibility for all must be supported and also preserved. So what do we have? So essentially at a traffic control or at a traffic intersection that is signalized, we have two types of buttons currently available. We have the regular buttons, which essentially you would see on the right-hand side of your screen. And on the left-hand side, you would have something called an APS button or an audible pedestrian signal. Now, the one thing that's in common for all of these buttons, if you take a look at it, is the actual size of the device in the middle of those buttons 
that is used to actuate the signals. Now these particular buttons all comply with the American Disabilities Act, which, which here in Canada we have adopted, which means that the actual size of the uh, device that is used to push a button is of a consistent size. And in this case, it's approximately two inches uh, in diameter. So the one thing about it as well too, is that it does require a particular amount of force to activate it, but not much. It can go up to five pounds. And the other thing as well too, is that you can also utilize, uh, other than your hands, you can utilize your elbows or other parts of your body to um, to activate the signals when required. And we've even seen in one instance of a visually impaired person with a seeing eye dog using their snout to push a button. But essentially what's happening is that agencies are putting a lot of their intersections into recall mode, which means that the ped lights come up automatically and that the pedestrians do not need to touch the uh, button. So that means that the walk signal will come out automatically at that time. So where are we heading and where we are before and even after this uh, latest crisis? So first of all, there's some questions that are being asked and also some suggestions are being given is, first of all, is that uh, do we even need uh, push buttons? So why can't we use apps instead of buttons for navigation, actuation, and crossing information? Other thing as well too is tech companies are coming up uh, with apps and fobs and why not use them? Is there a better way, including a touchless, to affect a what they call a contact closure for pedestrian calls? So when we do investigate these items, the one thing that we do have to understand as well is that there are existing standards for pedestrian signals, the detection of those uh, signals, and also the facilities of where those signals and buttons are installed at. Here in Ontario that we have something called the AODA Act, which is indicates how we need to move forward when we're updating an intersection and what uh, requirements and what products are required in order to aid the visually impaired person and mobility uh, impaired people. And also for on the national side is that we also have the MUTCD that indicates as well too how pedestrian control, control features and facilities need to operate. So one thing I just wanted to uh, talk about in terms of handheld devices as our apps, uh, Janet Barlow on the 28th of April uh, who is with the Accessible Design for the Blind had indicated in a recent seminar that she had indicated, uh, she talked about, sorry, a handheld or personal devices. And she said, and the, was, the question was, can't they be used in place of, or as a substitute for APS? She had indicated that you don't replace an APS that is available on the street any more than they would replace the visual pedestrian signal. Uh, individuals who are elderly, blind or deaf blind should not have to know about a special program or to get a special device to access pedestrian signal information. She also goes on to say that for handheld or per personal devices, that even if a de person does know about a special program app or device, they may forget it, the battery may be dead, hands may be full or occupied, and you may not be able to use it effectively. Other things to consider as well too is that it may not be able to afford or purchase or maintain the device. However, it can be used as a supplemental uh, device for APS and pedestrian signal information. Also, Donna Smith from Sound Transit provided a, uh, a seminar as well too on the 30th of April where she had indicated about trying to migrate stress and try how do we navigate it and she had basically indicated that you consider the travel needs for everyone. Uh, you install accessible pedestrian signals, which includes tactile features in the design at the intersection. You use braille signs and audio, audio messaging. And what benefits people with, with disabilities will also benefit everyone. So what do you get with that physical device? So if we talk about APS, the MUTCD indicates that for APS buttons, some of the basic operation requirements are as follows. Uh, first of all is that we have a speaker and the speaker is included into the button itself, which essentially um, generates the audible tones and or messages when uh, the signal is, inactive, is in use. 
There's also a automatic volume adjustment or there's a microphone that is in place of the button as well too. And what that does is that it listens to the ambient noise that is generated out into the intersection and it adjusts that in accordance to the level of sound that is at the intersection at the time. So when it's quiet, that the sound generated from this device is relatively low. And then when the sound is uh, elevated because of a truck or a large number of traffic, cars and things like that that's on, that it also increases to give the people the ability to understand that this is the button where it's located. The other thing to take into consideration as well too is that the button shall have a arrow which is a uh, high contrast and when the walk light is on that that arrow actually vibrates to give people who are visually impaired or you want to confirm that the walk light is on that that will actually go ahead and vibrate. Now the one thing is that there's a locating tone as well too that would provide guidance for people who require it to cross the, the intersection which is similar as this. So is there a way to combine the required and base levels for accessibility for access for all physical devices with electronic or apps moving forward? Yes, and there is. And basically what we do have is uh, Polara has introduced something called a pet app. And what this is, is that this is an app that is used on your smartphone, whether it's an iOS or if it is Android based. And it's used and combined with the latest button that is available called the INS. This particular app can provide intersection crossing information, which includes location as well as directionality. You can go ahead, the agency can go ahead and control the usage at the intersections where you have these buttons installed. And also the app also works with the existing te text to speech uh, feature built into smartphones. So users who use that right now, it is used in conjunction with that. So that way that there, uh, some of the features that are um, on that um, uh, smartphone can be utilized for people who have the app as well too. So this here basically is a, uh, I'm gonna play this about a minute or so. I'm gonna play the actual app on the phone. This is on an iOS device. But the one thing to take into consideration as well too is that when you actually open the app, we indicate that this application is only intended as a supplemental aid and should not be used as a sole source of crossing information. It is strongly recommended that you still physically confirm your crossing location and crossing alignment and walk status information with the physical button and the information it provides. So again, do not forget that the reason why that this is here as well is that we already have existing infrastructure in place that has been mandated by different provincial and uh, federal regulations. And this is actually a supplemental aid. So I'm just gonna uh, play this about for a minute. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, Annika, but can you actually hear this? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. So what I'll do, it's it's in the actual um, presentation, so it should be available uh, for you when I provide it. But in any case, right now, uh, Yannicka, this is what we do have to offer. And I'll stop this right now. Thank you. And uh, i like to say thank you very much uh, to you again, Yannicka, and to everyone attending today on um, listening to the presentation. And I'll take some questions. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. The PED app, is that available in North America or is it available globally? Uh, it's available basically um, available uh, through Polera on their website, or sorry, not on the website, but either at the Apple Store or the Play Store from Android. 
uh, and it's available globally. Okay. Second question is, um, um, in, in one of the slides, one of the last uh, slides in the presentation, uh, it says that the app should be, uh, sorry, used in conjunction. It's only as a supplemental aid. Uh, please confirm your crossing location, blah, 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 with a yes. physical button. But yes. we also want to make sure that with COVID-19 that we don't touch physical buttons. So, Correct. right, unless we have gloves or hand sanitizers on us, which we don't always have on us. Um, right. So uh, is there going to be a uh, change in standards then that you mentioned through the uh, MUTCD or um, AOA? -O -A -D? AODA? Yeah. Well, basically, Yannicka, first of all, if I may answer the, the, your first part of the question, uh, this essentially would eliminate the need for you to push the button. So in okay. a sense, what it does is that it, it uh, communicates to the infrastructure at the intersection through a Bluetooth uh, connection and uh, through the app and through the equipment that's at the, at the lights would make um, or would enable you to cross in whichever direction that you want to cross. Now, it is a supplemental aid as well to what we indicated. Now, whether or not if in fact if this is something that would require a change within the uh, either AODA or the MUTCD or whether it is yet to be determined. I My personal feeling is, is that this would be something that would be an adder to above the, um, the minimum standards because not all locations would have this feature and I think it would not be uh, fair that it's, it's mandated to everyone uh, to have something like this. Okay. One question, we talked about it yesterday as we prepared for the webinar about the AODA. What does MUTCD stand for? Uh, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Okay, and that is something applicable, applicable to North America or Canada? It's basically, it's applicable to uh, both the United States as well as Canada. And there would be versions of something similar with other countries within the world. Uh, it's basically, it's been adopted, I do believe it originated in the United States, and we here in Canada essentially had um, taken that and, um, how do I say it, massaged it to uh, our local needs here in Canada, but we do have something that is uh, used nationally, which is called the MUTCD. Okay, thank you very much. And those were the questions I had. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome, Yannicka, and thank you to everyone. And. Um, I was not going to say, um, but I do. So, and with that, we um, come to the end of this webinar. I thank you very much. And I do apologize that we went over time a little bit. Thank you all uh, presenters, um, Amir, Sophie, Nicholas, and Jeff for your presentations today. Our next webinar and last webinar in this series will be next week, June 2nd. And then we will start um, lunch and learn events coming in June. Um, don't forget the ITS Canada Awards virtual celebration will happen on June 15th, that's Monday. And the webinar recording uh, of today's webinar will be available either later on tonight or available tomorrow on the ITS Canada website. And with that, I thank all of you. Uh, stay safe and have a great rest of your afternoon.